sudden financial shocks like medical injury or job loss or divorce. And bankruptcy is supposed to be their lifeline. The problem is that the lifeline is broken. It costs uh, $1,500 to hire a lawyer. It takes, it's basically too hard to file on your own without help. And legal aid organizations can only serve uh, a fraction of demand. And so as a result, there's a scholarship that shows that over 19 million American households would benefit from filing for bankruptcy. And last year, under half a million or, or 3% did file. And what happens is all of these people, they remain trapped in the cycle of poverty, remain buried in debt, and they have reduced access to uh, banking, to credit, and they also uh, have a lower likelihood of being employed than if they'd come through the, the Chapter 7 process. So we are, as I said, the first TurboTax for bankruptcy. And we're using uh, academic research from Harvard Law School's Access to Justice Lab, where we spun out of last year, and, um, and technology to, to solve this problem. So the, the way that our program works is users can go to our webpage and they'll create an account. And while they're there, they'll go through seven steps that you need to file uh, for bankruptcy, for chapter seven bankruptcy. And uh, the first step is they have to uh, upload a credit report that is gonna have all their creditors listed on it. Second step is they have to upload uh, tax returns and pay stubs, which are required documents to file for bankruptcy. And then step three, they take a mandatory budgeting course. And then at step four, that's really the meat and potatoes of the product. And that is a guided survey that uses these cartoons from Harvard Law School's Access to Justice Lab which are designed to simplify these really intimidating financial questions and to make them understandable by a low income uh, audience that is not necessarily super tech savvy. And that's also in probably one of the lowest points of their lives when on the verge of filing for bankruptcy. So once they complete that survey, they, the software produces a PDF of a draft petition all the documents that they need to uh, file for bankruptcy. And it's basically, it produces a B petition, the software, and it gets emailed to one of our legal aid partners. And um, they can edit it in under an hour, usually. And at that point, the client uh, takes the document. We'll, we usually will meet with the, uh, the legal aid attorney, uh, either in person or, or remotely. Um, the petition will be printed out and the client will take it to the bankruptcy court and, uh, and file a pro se. And at that point, at the end of step five, we have uh, two more steps that, that automate the, the remaining administrative steps that you need to file, uh, you need to follow to, to file for bankruptcy and get a fresh start. And neither of those steps involve any attorney involvement. So what we've done is we've taken a process that usually involves 10 hours for a lawyer, and we've reduced it to about two hours of attorney time. So, so far, we've, um, we've tested this, and we've gotten uh, fresh starts for about 50 people in the Brooklyn area. We've diagnosed over 1,000 people with our web app, and we've erased over $2 million in debt. So this is the team that we have behind this. My background is I used to be a corporate bankruptcy lawyer at Morrison and Forster. And while I was doing that, I was working on chapter 11 cases, but the, the cases that I really love were the pro bono uh, chapter seven cases that, that I was doing. And, and I love the impact that these cases were making. I was changing people's lives forever, really cleaning up their balance sheets and they'd go on to get you know, better jobs and, and to, uh, to really change their lives. But I hated the fact that it took so many hours of routine data entry. 
and document collection and things that I didn't really go to law school to do. And so I thought that there had to be a way to, to automate that process. And that's what led to Upsolve, along with my co-founder, Rohan, who had been working out of Harvard, Harvard's uh, Access to Justice Lab with a professor named Jim Greiner there, working on these cartoons and, and simplifying the Chapter 7 process with Jim. And then our third co-founder, Kevin, uh, he's our CTO, and he has a really unique skill set. He is the only full-stack programmer in the country who also has a LLM in bankruptcy law. And his dad... <laughs> yeah, uh, what a client. <laughs> exactly. Um, so Kevin's dad actually had a quadruple bypass surgery in the 90s and racked up, I think, $100,000 in in debt from all these different surgeries and his dad filed for bankruptcy and got a fresh start and you know that really turned their family around so this is an issue that, that we're really passionate about on a, on a personal level as well and uh, we also in addition to, to the co-founders we also have this awesome advisory board behind us we have uh, professor Greiner who I mentioned at Harvard Law School who designed these cartoon we have a former deputy CTO of the United States Nick Sinai and, um, and then probably most importantly, we have five uh, bankruptcy judges. So this is a pretty disruptive thing that, that we're doing in the bankruptcy world. And it's really important that we have um, all these judges behind us uh, because it gives us a lot of credibility in, in the space. And uh, this is the judge who did the Kodak bankruptcy. This is the judge who did the G General Motors bankruptcy, um, chief bankruptcy judge in Alabama, uh, Judge Calloway has had a lot of problems. So, so that's been great for, for our mission as well. So far, we've been funded by uh, the Robin Hood Foundation in New York, which is a really well-known uh, foundation run by a bunch of hedge fund guys who want to impose uh, finance-based metrics, basically, in the charity world. And, um, and we've also just recently got a, uh, a large TIG grant from the LSC that we're going to use to scale this nationwide. And then uh, finally, we've gotten grants from Harvard, Princeton, and Yale Law School. And I didn't get into any of these schools, but they're funding us, so that makes my mom pretty proud. Um, so this is, if you look at the states in blue, these are all states that have legal aid organizations that have applied for grants to the American College of Bankruptcy to buy licenses of our software. So we're currently selling annual subscriptions to all the legal aid nonprofits in the country to help them multiply the number of folks they're able to serve. And organizations in, in all of these states have uh, want to uh, use our software. So our goal for the next year is we want to cement all these partnerships, expand to 50 states, and erase $30 million in debt, bringing a whole bunch of people out of poverty with a fresh start across the country. So that's our, our story. I'm happy at this point to give you guys either a, a brief demo of, of how the app works, or I can Yeah, that'd take, be great. That would? Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. All right, so let's see where we are. So as I said, this is, can everybody see my screen right now? Not yet, no, it's like frozen now. <laughs> I think I, uh, let's see what I did. I'm having trouble um, moving. Do you want to unshare the screen for a moment and then try to share again? Yeah, my, so the problem is, is I'm, 
I've lost the, for some reason I can't pull up Zoom and I'm, I don't want to uh, quit because then I'm going to lose you guys. Um, is, do you know what I can do to, to bring Zoom forward? Uh, should be in your apps, I think. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's open, but I just can't get it to, to appear on the screen. Sometimes it's hard oh, to find. I see you guys. Uh, okay, so now, what do I need to do? Now something's happening. All right. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Yep. Perfect. Awesome. We did it. Brooklyn, we did it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so this is the main screen uh, of the current version of, of the app with, with the seven steps. Once you click on step four, you get routed to, to this. And so this is the main TurboTax piece where a debtor will uh, answer all the questions about his finances, what he spends, what he makes, what he owes, what he owns. And, um, and then the answers to this will go into the PDF of the draft documents. And so what you'll see is you see this, this cartoon character named Blob and Blob has been designed as a, a stick figure by the Harvard folks. And the idea behind him is Blob isn't any particular gender. He could be male or female, as you see. <laughs> um, he could be male or female. He could be black or white. And so anybody, regardless of where they're coming to this from, can identify with Blob. And so what Blob will do is he's not just asking questions um, like TurboTax would, which is, you know, just question one, question two. Blob is also um, trying to make this process a little bit less intimidating. So he's using language to, to kind of inspire people and pump them up. So like, this is a perfect example. Like we're, we're in this together, John. We're gonna ask you about some information about your finances. Uh, this is another big insight from the Harvard study is that if you ask people to write down their why before undergoing a complicated legal process, they're much more likely to get to the end of it. So if you ask somebody, um, why do you, why did, what does a fresh start mean to you? Why do you care about filing for bankruptcy? Then, and, and they actually write that down. So for instance, I want to uh, control my debt so that I can pay for my kids to go to college. If you ask them to do that and they do it, it significantly increases the likelihood that they'll get to the end of the survey. So that's something from, from Jim Griner's research that we've incorporated into our app. And we do that kind of stuff throughout the app. Here's Blob again. Uh, we try to break down the questions that we're asking people and we try to preview the order that, that we're going to give it to them. So first, we're going to ask you general information about yourself and your family. Then we're going to ask you stuff about your income and your expenses. And then you're going to give us all your information about your property and we're going to help you get through it. Have you ever used any names in the last eight years? This is you know, one of the questions that uh, the bankruptcy forms requires. Um, basically, all of these questions are, are um, a very straightforward interface. For the, the more complicated ones, we're using Blob, the, the cartoon guy. And, um, and as I said, this takes what was usually a 10-hour uh, a pro bono process that involves a lot of 
uh, handwritten stuff, a lot of data entry, a lot of manual document collection, and it reduces it to about two hours of attorney time. So we're really excited to, uh, to scale this around the country and, uh, and hopefully help a lot of folks get a fresh start. And with, cool. yeah, with that, I'm happy to take any questions, Roland. Great. Any questions, anyone? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, are you acquiring users exclusively through legal aid signings, those licenses, or are you doing any sort of direct outreach as well? We've experimented with a lot of different things for user acquisition. Right now, we're using exclusively uh, legal aid as our distribution, as our, our client acquisition. Um, but we've also talked with some really large fintech companies. One in particular has 60 million users, and they've told us that the bottom 20% of those 60 million users could, <laughs> could benefit from potentially filing for bankruptcy. And they've discussed um, funneling them to, to us once we've built the next version of our software. So that would be really exciting in terms of scaling our impact. What kind of a system are you, is this completely uh, built from, from scratch? Are you using some kind of uh, logic engine or something or to? So right I've... now, the, the, the current version of, of our software, our, our MVP, was built in this program called Typeform, which you can see the, um, the icon down here. And Typeform, for, for those who aren't uh, familiar with it, is, one is a, is a logic engine. It's a, a really fancy version of Google Forms, basically, that has branching logic. You can use photos, you can use videos, images, like we have a blob. And, um, and for anybody who's thinking about starting something, um, Typeform is fantastic because you don't have to do any coding. Um, and once you have the, the logic of your questions mapped out, you can get out there with a, with a product and, uh, and test it with users. And so, so for that, for us, it's been uh, really helpful until we now are doing a more customized solution. So Raj has a question and I just see him come into the, yeah. the hey. video. So, hey Raj. Can you hear me? Hey, Hello. I can hear you well, yeah. Saying. Um, hi, Jonathan. So first of all, congratulations. This is a really great effort. I mean, I, I think it can help a lot of people. And so it's a good job. Um, you know, I have a few questions. So. First of all, like um, I went through your workflow today just to see what it was like. And so after the workflow is complete or someone leaves the workflow, uh, do you send any messages back to the person because you've collected their emails to go remind them to finish it or set, leave it a particular step in the workflow and come back to it? Um, first, yeah. that's my first question. We do, yeah. Uh, yeah, and then the second, because I haven't received one yet, but you know, that's one thing. The perhaps you do it in a frequency, but that sometimes can get people to finish the workflow. The other is, um, you know, um, personal or, or business kind of bankruptcies. It seems like you're focusing on individual bankruptcy rather than small business bankruptcy. Is that right? Yes, we we definitely are are, you know, just focused on individual bankruptcy. I'd love, yeah. to to, I'd love to be able to automate Kodak's Chapter 11 case because I'm sure I can make a ton of money doing that, but <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think that is uh, technically possible. Uh, yeah, well, some, some of them are very small businesses, you know, sole proprietorships that just start out with like two guys and they come up with an idea. And so they're not really big, you know, there's a, almost a, a pseudo, and that's a lot of the companies we represent. So my law firm represents 57,000 clients. Uh, we're the largest trademark filing law firm. So we have lots and lots of very small businesses that use our website, Trademarkia, to file trademark applications. Cool. Um, I imagine many of them, you know, when their trademark goes abandoned, it's kind of likely their business also winds down. So it seems like the other big discussion here is like restructuring of assets, because obviously the goal in bankruptcy seems to be to avoid bankruptcy. Um, at what stage does someone use your platform? Is they've already kind of been evaluated for um, you know, potential restructuring of their assets so they can avoid bankruptcy? Or how does someone, what's the point where they engage you? At this point, they've all been diagnosed by our legal aid providers who are, are funneling us clients. Uh, in the future, mm -hmm. we can automate a lot of that diagnosis, though. 
Yeah, so I think that that would be interesting to automate the diagnosis because I didn't see that in the workflow. Of another area of really opportunity is to help a, a, an individual figure out is there anything they can do to avoid bankruptcy by looking at their assets and liabilities and a workflow for that would be interesting. Um, lastly, you know, have you th thought of, since you're a nonprofit, have you thought about open sourcing your kind of methodology and your kind of workflow? So our website, for example, Trademarkia, yeah, we can, we can, if you wanted to go national, we could have a lot of potential leads for your platform, um, you know, probably overwhelm it because it seems like it's dependent on volunteers. But uh, have you thought about, you know, uh, both how, you know, scalable it is with a pure nonprofit model as opposed to actually charging for some of these services. And if it's a pure nonprofit, you know, how how much are you committed to kind of open sourcing the the workflow, if at all? Yeah, Raj. So so we are open sourcing the next version that we're doing. Um, mm -hmm. as a nonprofit. You know, we'd love it if people could take the our code base and use it for other areas of, of the law for access to justice initiatives. Um, your second, sorry, what was your second question, Raj, about? Well, the main thing is, you know, you have, you have a limited number of people right now that first have to evaluate whether or not the company can, um, you know, be restructured and then they're referred to this workflow and they're doing it as volunteers. Um, have you thought about, you know, kind of like a legal Zoom like model where there's actually a paid service to evaluate this? in addition to a, you know, kind of a pure nonprofit one. Yeah, I mean, so, so the challenge with a for-profit doing what we're doing is unauthorized practice of law regulations. Um, there's that because there's a whole bunch of legal advice involved in this. Uh, and then the other issue is apart from state law rules on unauthorized practice of law, the bankruptcy code itself has its own set of UPL regulations, which are actually much stricter than the state law regs, believe it or not. So, uh, so basically, that's why there ha hasn't been a, a for-profit provider of what we're doing. Right. So you're a lawyer, though, so you, you could create your own law firm and kind of have that. Is it federal law or is it also kind of state regulated law? And so it kind of crosses both boundaries. Does someone have to be licensed in the state as well as federal to practice it or? Um, bankruptcy law yeah you i need to, i need to be practiced to be licensed in uh california if i wanted to help somebody file for bankruptcy there. But i see is primarily yeah, um, yeah so what's your you know so what's your kind of vision for this is it to kind of scale it as a non-profit and try yeah. to attract uh, attorneys in different states and private institutions um and how does you know what's the how, how do you sustain your model? Is, it, is that, that kind of what you're, you're looking to do? Or? That is exactly what we're looking to do. We're looking to uh, basically multiply the number of legal aid eligible clients who are able to get a fresh start each year. And you know, there's a lot of pro bono resources we can do uh, to use that in terms of that, that one hour of, of document review. And um, and, you know, it is, to your point, it is less scalable than if we were just a pure uh, TurboTax model um, that could, you know, and particularly if you're charging users, you know, there's, it's an easier business model. And the, the business model, our business model as a nonprofit um, is, it's a challenge. So we, we charge subscriptions to these legal aid clients of ours, the, the nonprofits. Uh, but we also rely on grants from uh, institutions like the Legal Services Corporation and the Robin Hood Foundation. So, yeah, so, you know, we can talk later. If you want to increase your funnel of potential leads, there's, there's opportunities that we well, might be able to help you with, with that. Yeah, you. you can email me and we'll take it there okay. from there. Cool. Right. Any, any other questions for Jonathan? <clears throat> Jonathan... Uh, how turbo tax centric are you uh, for its potential to interface with QuickBooks and also in uh, eventually down the line in other countries and other languages since QuickBooks is in so many languages are you using TurboTax as kind of a standard and 
even as it might develop with some cryptocurrency and things like that in your vision? Um, no, I think the short answer is no, we're not, um, we're not integrating with, with QuickBooks or, or cryptocurrency. Our, our debtors uh, are basically 200% of the federal poverty line. So they generally don't own small businesses. Um, they generally, you know, they're, they're not savvy enough for cryptocurrency. Um, and do, does that answer your question? I think I might've missed something. Yeah. Thanks. The potential for QuickBooks, although it's for profit, uh, I think, isn't it? Um, is remarkable as a growth engine, uh, but it, it is, um, you know, a separate entity. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting thought. Thank you. So, um, what was I going to ask you? Um, I lost my question. Anyone else has a question for Jonathan? No, well then, uh, thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan, for joining us. It's been Thanks great to have you. Good luck with your next steps. Um, and uh, ah, here's my question, actually. Um, were you, uh, so since LSC is one of your investors, um, did they uh, help you sort of uh, get the technology to all the legal aid groups or? Yeah, I mean, you... definitely a big, a big sign of, uh, a big stamp of approval to have a grant from the LSC uh, because, you know, that the LSC is the primary funder of, of most of these organizations. And, uh, and so that's been awesome, yeah. But they then don't mandate or require no. their, no. you still have to go to, to all the legal aid groups that basically sign them up. I do, yeah. Okay, all right, great. Well, great, well, thank you so much. It was great having you. This is a very, very cool project and good luck with your next steps. Thanks, Roland. Thank you, John. <laughs> Let's turn it over to Matt now. Um, Tell us if you could unshare your screen, please. Yes. Okay. Great. Can you? Can everyone hear me? Yes, you can. <clears throat> Perfect. Great. Um, so, hi. My name is Matt Osman. Uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO of uh, Legit Patents. Uh, let me know if you can see my screen. Great. Um, so we're a, an AI company um, focused on improving the quality of intellectual property. Um, so specifically focused initially on, on invention disclosure. Um, and just so the mission of the company is to um, reclaim attorney time throughout the uh, patent process um, by putting more power and control in the, in the hands of the inventors. Um, who really are the expert in, in the thing that they've invented. Um, so the problem that we're actually initially trying to solve um, is best represented by the, the abstract um, image that you can see on the right there, which is the invention disclosure form. Um, now, the contents of this form are, is pretty much the raw material of all intellectual property. Uh, and the way that inventors currently interact with disclosing what they've invented hasn't really changed since 1983. Um, they fill out a Word document, a piece of paper. If they're very lucky, uh, it's a web app. Um, and then this documentation of an invention, which is uh, normally responses to a bunch of questions, um, then gets sent to the legal department, to the IP department, or to a, a patent attorney, um, for eventual human review. Uh, and the problem is, is, is one of scale um, and also intelligibility. So there are 2.9 million patent applications every year. Um, there are tens of millions of invention disclosures. Uh, a Fortune 500 company might get 10,000 of these in a year. Uh, with a very small uh, IP staff, uh, it's very difficult to audit and track what is a good invention, what is a bad invention, um, a huge amount of information is lost, especially because inventors, particularly if they're first time inventors or, or new to the patent process, don't know how to fill out one of these forms. Um, so the way that all intellectual property uh, that's 
going to become a patent is harvested hasn't changed since the 80s and it's incredibly rigid. Um, so no allowance is made for uh, expertise. You don't ask different questions depending on whether someone is an expert in mechanical engineering versus uh, autonomous vehicle software technology, for example. So you had a huge amount of information loss. Um, so the team that we've built to, to tackle this problem um, is very, very focused on um, the AI portion of it. So a lot of experience in natural language processing. Um, my background is I was a barrister in the UK, um, actually with, a, with an expertise or an interest in, in uh, offshore tax structuring. Uh, then I went into asset management for a while before setting up the company. Um, my co-founder and CTO, Jacob Rosen, um, did a lot of very exciting and pioneering work in uh, tax avoidance detection using genetic algorithms. Um, and our chief scientist um, has a PhD in, in computer science, uh, is also a lecturer uh, in advanced natural language processing at Tufts. And then we're advised by uh, Dr. Unamay O'Reilly at, at the Computer Science and AI Lab at CSAIL. Um, we also just hired another AI researcher who rather brilliantly did her um, PhD in uh, NLP applied to, to, to patents. Um, so the technology that we've built um, that underlies uh, what we're able to do with the invention disclosure process it is based on our ability to compare a free text description of an invention against um, the patent database or a internal corpus of data very, very quickly. Um, so an inventor can type in a free text description of what they've invented, or they can answer one of the traditional questions that you would answer in the invention disclosure form in natural language. Um, then what we do is we extract the relevant concepts and we match that against around 30 million uh, patent objects. Um, for the purpose of this demo, it'll be independent claims, but it can actually be any, really, any patent object. We did that in a round trip time for about three to four seconds. Um, so we did some fun math, and if you were to work out uh, how long it would take an associate and IP law firm to compare a description of an invention against all of the claims in the patent database, the US patent database, yeah, it would cost you about just, just shy of $90 million uh, at the average billable hour rate. Um, so the reason this is enormously important is that we think that AI is going to play a fundamental role in the way that intellectual property is not just protected, but also created. Um, and there are some very, very interesting companies working on process uh, and also kind of post-grant management of intellectual property. So docketing software for renewals um, and litigation. Uh, there's some really interesting work in natural language generation. So the, the idea of, of, of going from claim to a, uh, uh, to a, to a patent application, um, but almost no work or not enough work is being done on the actual input, which is the invention disclosure. It's the invention itself. Uh, and I think that what we see is a, is a dynamic, which is a play in a lot of other, um, a lot of other industries that are very data centric, which is you have a kind of a garbage in garbage out issue. Um, so our view is that we want to start with improving the quality of invention disclosures um, by making the invention disclosure process incredibly dynamic. Um, so we basically built software that interviews the uh, inventor about their idea almost as a, as a patent attorney would, instead of them filling out a, this static form which doesn't give them any feedback uh, on what they've invented. And the aim is... Um, over time to build up what we think of as like an AI powered patent factory. Um, but everything has to start with invention disclosure um, because that, as I said, is, is the raw material um, which affects the downstream value of any asset that you would create from it. Um, so, okay, let me shift. Perfect. So, what we did for this demo, this is a, a kind of a truncated version of, of what is a much, much longer um, process when it's in, uh, when it's in deployment, um, is we took the, the classic questions that um, an attorney would ask uh, an inventor about uh, what they've invented, and this might be an internal IP attorney, it might be outside counsel, but they, they would normally ask a question like, uh, describe the problem that you were trying to solve uh, that led to your development. Um, so if we just take, this is a free text description of a uh, car seat. 
So uh, the problem that you're trying to solve is that traditional car seats are very static and they have uh, limited uh, dynamic comfort capabilities. Uh, so what we do is we match that against 30 million uh, claims in the patent database and we return here the six most relevant out of, I think it's actually just a little, a little shy of 30 million. Um, so you'll see here a car seat, seat structure, car, vehicle seat assembly, vehicle seat assembly. Um, now, what this does uh, within an enterprise setting, which is where we're initially deploying, uh, is it all of the data that the inventor is, is inputting into the system is captured and used to inform the IP department about ways that they can improve their process. So I've just described as an inventor a particular problem, which is uh, the rigidity of car seats. What that can do is then identify the, on the back end, the attorney within a particular, you know, say this is uh, General Motors. Uh, it'll identify the, the patent attorney within General Motors who's written the most uh, patents on car seats. Uh, and then they can begin to interact with the inventor much, much earlier in the process. Um, you're able to capture a huge amount of very, very valuable information that is otherwise uh, completely lost by just using a PDF. So what we do is we then ask the inventor to drag and drop the results in order of relevance. Um, so I say, I think this one's relevant, this one's relevant, this one's relevant, uh, this one maybe less so. Um, then what we do is we, the, the, we've, what we've done is we've, we've taken the process of invention disclosure and we've slightly gamified it. We've also made sure that uh, instead of just uh, showing the inventor um, other inventions that exist within the patent database that might be similar to what they've invented, we also show them uh, particular inventions that the company that they work for um, invented so that you can prevent you know, double spending on R&D, for example. Um, you can identify potential collaborations between inventors. So this, this section here will perform a search against um, all of the invention disclosures that General Motors has, for example. So you can identify that this particular inventor is working on something that was actually tried about a year ago and failed for a particular reason, or is working on something um, that another team on the other side of the world, but in the same company is also working on and, and that there might be a possibility for collaboration there. Um, and all of this data is stored. Uh, it's able to be presented to the IP department in a, in a kind of a dashboard format. And I should point out as well that we put a huge amount of control, administrative control in the hands of the intellectual property department. So uh, if the IP department decide they, they don't want uh, inventors to see patents from a particular, um, particular jurisdiction, um, or they don't want to kind of confuse them by showing them uh, patents that they already own or patents that are that's owned by a competitor, um, we give that data control uh, to the invention disclosure uh, department, uh, sorry, to the IP department. Uh, so then let's say the plan usage is this. Detailed description. So all of this is the administrative information that a regular invention disclosure form would have to capture. Um, but we elicit much more, uh, the, the quality of the results that we elicit from the inventors ends up being much, much higher because they're seeing their invention in the context of what's already been invented. And determining the context of what's been invented is part of the job of the, of the patent attorney interview. Um, so if we ask the inventor, what makes your solution unique? Um, and then let's put in the differences in the advantages of the solution. We again show them uh, the most relevant uh, solutions that already exist. Uh, and we ask them to distinguish between the solution that they've come up with uh, and the solution that already exists. And part of that process is, is, is actually what a patent attorney is doing during the interview in order to try and elicit what is actually patentable and where the value might be. So um, obviously each time someone's clicking yes or no here, this is, this is data labeling for machine learning purposes. Um, 
So yes, this is a similar claim, but my invention is different because uh, of this. And so we, we take the inventor through a series of these processes uh, to gradually elicit over time in a slightly gamified way exactly what it is they've invented uh, and why it's different. At the same time as being allowing the IP department to actually track invention and invention quality in real time in a way that's just not possible by trying to audit, you know, 10,000 pieces of paper that might come in at, at, at odd sporadic times. Um, so what it does, it kind of networks inventors uh, within an organization uh, and allows the attorneys to have um, kind of real-time visibility into uh, how inventive their organization is being because at the moment, um, the only metric they're probably tracking is number of disclosures, maybe number of patent applications and the percentage of applications that go from the application stage um, to the grant stage. Uh, and so this is, these are kind of a, a couple of tasks. Um, there are around 15 to 20 in total. Um, the, one of the key innovations uh, and, and kind of where, we've, um, where we're putting in uh, some very interesting additional AI is that we're tracking the quality of the questions that are asked over time. Um, so as I mentioned, the current process to extract potentially patentable information from an inventor, either at a solo inventor level or you know, in, a, in a Microsoft, um, they'll normally ask the same 20 questions of everyone, regardless if you file patents before, regardless if you're in a completely different domain from someone else. Um, what we can do is we can identify the, we keep on file the experience of every inventor, so we can provide educational uh, components to the flow. If the inventor doesn't know what a claim is, for example, doesn't know what needs to go into a patent. But additionally, we're tracking what kind of questions prompt the best uh, responses as determined by the IP department for certain um, uh, technology areas for certain levels of experience. Um, so over time, you, you develop a, a much more efficient and quality method of extracting the relevant information um, for the intellectual property process. Um, and all of the, all of the background data um, is available to the IP department in a way that, that is currently uh, not available. Um, so with that short demo, um, I'm very happy to, to take any questions that anyone has. All right. Questions for Matt, anyone? Yeah, I have a question. Go ahead. Hello. Yeah. Hi, uh, Matt. This is uh, Raj Abiyankar. I, I have a couple questions. So first, um, you know, as you disc enter invention disclosure, I'm a patent attorney. So when you and when you write an invention disclosure document inside a company, oh, you write. You, the could, you, could you repeat that? I, I, you dropped off. Um, could you repeat yeah, the beginning of the um, question? Sure. My main question is. Um, you're, you're uncovering potential prior art that has to then be disclosed in an information disclosure statement. Um, are you solving the problem of making sure that the, the inventor and the, you know, and how do you address the issue of now that you've uncovered power prior art, you have this duty to disclose that prior art if there's a patent application later drafted? How, how do you address that? Yeah, so there are a couple of controls that we put in the hands of the IP department. Um, one is that we give them the power to control what the inventor sees. Um, so you can, you can basically um, expunge uh, various uh, bits of the, you can expunge various features of the prior art that might be um, concerning. Um, and additionally, what we've built, which I haven't shown there, is an ability to um, translate uh, claims as well so that you you kind of get the relevant concepts without seeing the claim itself um, Yeah Yeah, um, and then so you know The main benefit that you seem to have here is to help the the in-house counsel determine which patent applications they should pursue from Submitted invention disclosures. Is that kind of the main problem you're trying to address? Yeah, I think there are, there are two problems, which is that um, it's very, very difficult without a huge amount of human labor to keep track of all these disclosures because they're paper-based or, you know, at best, it's a filled out PDF. Um, but additionally, 
So there's, there's kind of saving that time. And that's, that is a real problem, especially, um, you know, we're dealing with one enterprise client at the moment who has 10,000 invention disclosure forms a year. They have six attorneys. Um, and so, you know, that, that becomes a kind of a drinking the fire hose problem. The other is that um, there's a huge amount of information that is lost by just having an inventor fill out a Word document, um, which you know, can be leveraged for uh, you know, to, can be leveraged for future inventors. So there's a kind of a knowledge transfer aspect, um, but also to get uh, a much more efficient uh, R&D process. So quite often we found that um, by making, by kind of digitizing your invention disclosures, you can, identi you can identify when actually two inventors have tried to solve the same problem in broadly the same way, um, but one has failed. Uh, and you might be about to, to go down the road of, of, uh, of kind of double spending on R&D. Obviously, those kind of effects um, really come into play in larger enterprises rather than a sort of a solo inventor level. Right. So, um, you know, there's the whole thing, first of all, like some of the inventions that a company decides not to pursue end up becoming the most valuable and some inventors get frustrated and leave a company. So there's, it seems like there's another benefit that you have of kind of cataloging trade secrets inside the company and storing those trade secrets. Is that kind of right? Yeah, exactly. yeah that's absolutely, that's absolutely correct. Um, so what we do with, 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 um, working with corporate clients pretty much exclusively at the moment, so like, you know, large enterprises. Uh, and what we do is we take their internal corpus uh, and we use that. So we use a mixture of public data and also their private data so that inventors are shown um, and record things like trade secrets. Well, not necessarily show, they're not necessarily shown trade secrets, but the IP department is, is made aware of times where uh, inventors are about to disclose something that's very close to a, to a trade secret, for example. Um, so the idea is to leverage the internal corpus of organizations as well as, as publicly available data sets. So what's your vision then? Is your vision to kind of build this forward so then this information then the internal I, you know, patent committee can kind of coalesce around and kind of pick their favorite inventions and then assign a foreign counsel. Are you looking to build the entire workflow that happens, you know, in tiering the case of many multinationals will tier their patent cases as A, B, and C or something where they put yeah. priorities on it and hire different firms. Are you looking to build out the whole workflow that goes beyond um, this? Or where's your yes. focus? Yeah. Beyond? So I think um, we, see, we see kind of AI sitting at the, the patent committee uh, stage and also at the uh, R&D stage, which is that um, expertise location is a notoriously quite difficult problem in large-scale enterprises. Um, invention disclosures and, and what people say that they've invented is a, is a pretty good proxy for what their expertise is in. It's actually a very, very strong signal. Um, so when, and, you, when you say AI, I'm kind of confused by that because it seems like you're you know, pattern matching based on the words and you know, the kind of description to something else. Where's the AI? What is the, what is the AI you're referring to exactly? Yeah, so it comes, that comes in uh, two flavors. One is the natural language processing, which uh, underlies the matching, which we can kind of have a debate as to whether that's AI or not. Um, the other is the, is the fact that the system makes recommendations as to what questions to ask next based on past experience. So it, it, will, it will determine um, so-and-so has, has described a autonomous vehicle software system in the problem that they're solving. Um, we know from the internal company database that this person has never filed a patent before, in which case um, the workflow should be these eight modules. Um, and it kind of learn, learns that over time. Um, so that, that, I suppose, is the, is, the, is, the, is the learning component, which would broadly fall under AI. I see. So what is your execution model? Is it just to go out and find customers or what are you looking to do next? Is it to raise money? What are you looking to do? How do you grow your um, business? From you? Yeah, so we've, um, we've raised a pretty large seed round um, already and we're currently going into pilots with a couple of Fortune 100 companies and a Fortune 250 company. 
Um, so what we're actually looking for is, is as broad and early adopter um, customer base as possible. So what we're trying to do is to make sure that we don't solve um, this information extraction problem for, for just one sector. Um, so, you know, we're working with a, uh, an auto company, working with an insurance company, working with a bank, uh, we talk to a biotech company. Um, so the idea is to uh, basically convert the existing, um, the existing processes that people have into this kind of generalized information extraction process. So we're quite busy at the moment to answer your question. I see. That's all. Thank you. Okay. So, Matt, how do you make money, Matt? Yeah. So this is um, the model is enterprise-wide licensing. Um, so the the modules that we offer um, basically can be deployed to, are deployed to two users, two types of users. One is the inventor level. So you know, the people who are producing intellectual property at Google, for example. The other is a, a, an administrative module. Um, so the IP department who can track and audit um, the quality of inventions and also match up outside counsel if that's what they're doing for their patent applications um, with, the, with the correct inventor. So what we tend to do is we either do per user licensing um, depending on the, on the level of deployment um, or we do an enterprise wide license um, with a certain number of disclosures as a threshold and then, and then past that, it's, it's kind of staggered pricing. Can I just ask you, just going back to the natural language processing, um, mm -hmm. when you determine that those, um, you know, kind of matches you're making, that they're the most relevant, given the, um, you know, relevant in regards to the specific innovation disclosure, how do you determine that? Is that just by sort of, uh, kind of word frequency or is there also sort of a semantic or conceptual kind of analysis? It, it's of semantic. So we, we use, um, uh, the problem with, with any word frequency stuff in patterns is that um, as any patent attorney will tell you, you get to be your own lexicographer, uh, which makes traditional word frequency based strategies pretty poor. Um, because you can kind of define and use words how you see fit. Uh, and actually it's a trick used by a lot of, I say it's a trick, it is a skill employed by a lot of patent attorneys to try and hide inventions within the patent database. Because it's an open database and, and there's some advantage in, in, in opacity and you can do that by, um, by kind of trying to not come up in, in search terms. Um, so what we did is we built a semantic engine from scratch um, we built our own parser uh, from scratch um, and it performed, it's, it's kind of similar to, it's similar to word to vec but a, a market improvement and designed and trained specifically on the patent corpus. Um, I think one of the other things that we realized as well is that if you want to get labeled data on whether your results are actually relevant, you know, whether a, a technical description of a, an invention is, is similar to something that exists in the patent database, um, the best possible feedback is, is from inventors um, because they are de facto kind of experts. Um, so that, that, that training data set becomes very, very um, important to, to making the model better over time. But out, out of the box, it's, it's, actually, it's actually very good. Cool. All right, any more? Harry has a question. Hi, I'm Harry. Um, I have uh, two questions for you. One is, um, when is the sort of invention process are you envisioning to be used? Because you mentioned sort of something being filed for patents, but I imagine that has to be pretty late or something's already kind of ready to go. But you also mentioned the possibility that someone else might be working on something similar, which means you might want to sort of start this process up a lot earlier to make sure, you're, you know, if you wait too long, you've already duplicated your effort. Yeah. Um, so that's, a, that's an excellent question. And that's actually, um, Something I didn't show you, which we're working on at the moment, is, is uh, what we kind of think of as like a sandbox uh, type uh, app where you can describe your invention when, when it's in a much more embryonic stage uh, and then it performs that matching to try and identify people that are working on similar ideas to you either outside the company um, or in, internal to the company. 
So you wouldn't actually need that much more. That's like a much more exploratory version of the software um, in terms of its use case, not in terms of its development. So you can, you know, type in, here's what I'm working on. How new is it? And we'll give you a score as to how new it is relative to, you know, how similar it is to stuff that, you know, your company's working or stuff that, that already exists in the patent database. Okay, great. Uh, my other question was uh, a little different. You mentioned that you uh, have inventors sort of stating which inventors are there and then which ones aren't. Is there any possible issue with inventors sort of ego getting in the way and saying, my invention is so unique that none of these are actually that similar, when in reality, you know, there are lots of similarities between various patents? Yeah, I mean, so that's, um, that's interesting. So we did a lot of user testing with, um, so we're based right, right next to MIT. Um, and we've got a sort of strong MIT connection. So we did a lot of user testing at the inventor level and at the IP department level with um, the tech transfer office here and also with um, like a bunch of frequent filing um, patenters, or people who filed a bunch of patents in both MIT and also Harvard. And um, psychologically what tended to happen was that um, inventors, when they were shown stuff that was similar to their idea, ended up being much more willing and almost eager to tell you exactly why it's different. Um, because they, they think that their improvement is patentable, so they think it's better than everything that's out there. So they end up giving you a huge amount of information that they wouldn't otherwise through a static process. Um, so quite a lot of that is, is about harnessing the, like, the natural urge of one-upmanship one that you get amongst really clever people. Um, to, to giving you the right information that you need as a patent attorney later on to determine, well, actually, you know, this, this is a, this is a non-obvious, you know, step change to, to, to the art that that's been identified. Very interesting. Thank you. All right. Any, uh, final question? Uh, yes, Matt? this is, uh, yes, Matt, this is Rajan Gupta. I had a question for you. If I, if I have a new term or a new claim that I'm putting together, do I need to train the model again? So if you have a new, a new term. Right. A new term or a new claim that would not something that's unique, do I need to train the model again? Uh, no. So not currently. So um, the, what we do is we use, we train the model on like up-to-date um, up-to-date patent literature, which is updated weekly, and also um, the most up-to-date non-patent literature. So that includes internal literature and also um, kind of scientific, um, the traditional non-patent literature. Um, so is your question that if you'd, in, if you'd invented something that was never, that had never been heard of before, um, what the system would do? Is that the question? Uh, possibly, yes. If you've never, if you've, you're not sure, right? But it could be something that the system has never been aware of, or it may exist, but it's not something that's commonly used or referenced. Yeah, so um, it's actually pretty good at identifying um, kind of orth like traditionally orthogonal uh, matches that, that would cross traditionally orthogonal domains. So you might, for example, be working in mechanical engineering, but uh, and you might think that your technique is incredibly novel in mechanical engineering, but it ends up being a technique that's been like widely used in medical devices, for example. Um, so the techniques that we use are actually pretty good at that. Um, I suppose the best, the best response would be difficult to say without actually um, trying it uh, with, with, with what you're thinking, but um, it tends to be that there's nothing really new under the sun. Um, normally, Normally, there's, there's a remnant of something that, that already exists within the kind of idea data set um, in, in new ideas. But I, hypothetically, there could, be, there could be something that's, that's completely, uh, completely unknown. Uh, but I would imagine that some part of the process or product that you were trying to get patent protection on would use techniques um, that already exist. And so those would come up as relevant results. All right, well, on that note, you're pretty much at the end of our session today. Matt, thank you so much. It's very cool what you're working on. It's been great thank to you. have you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, and uh, we'll meet again next week. Uh, yes, we'll have two new presenters next week. 
All right, so uh, stay tuned. We'll send out an announcement early next week. All right, thank you all. Bye, Matt. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.